Okay. I am here with Nathan Ross Reese. Welcome, Nathan. How you going, Raph? Awesome to be here. <laughs> you too, mate. Good to see you. Um, yeah, and we, we are here to talk about the results or your observations of your experiences of your epic odyssey around uh, the, the Pilates tour of Australia, where you have visited 88 plus Pilates studios mm -hmm. and uh, done classes at all of them and given workshops at a lot of them, mm -hmm. or possibly all of them, and interacted with the trainers, the, the owners, the, the clients, etc. So you've, you've really done a mystery shopper, although I'm sure they knew you were there, but you've really done an audit, really, of, of the Pilates studios in Australia, um, right around the continent. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to talk about what you've learned, what you've observed, and what, what we as Pilates instructors can learn from that. But um, before we get there, uh, please introduce yourself. Who are you? Yeah, thanks, Raph. I'm Nathan Ross Rees. Um, now I work for myself, which is exciting. Um, so... I run workshops on how to use the reformer effectively. Um, also mentor clients, my clients are now instructors. So I have a reformer academy, which I teach people how to like target muscle groups and how to layer things, like essentially scale exercise to ability level. Um, so like the idea of graded exercise, I think is very appropriate because it's basically what you're doing. Because it goes all the way from the people that need to recover from injuries, I think, and then all the way up to like advanced dynamic style. So we're kind of sitting somewhere in the middle, maybe towards the higher end. But yeah, tailing it to ability level, what you need to do to do that. So I kind of went from being a full-time instructor, teaching like 40 hours a week. Now I teach um, maybe one or two classes a week um, and I've switched to being online mainly, but... I'm traveling around Australia in the process. So I've been on the road for about three months and you know, it's been wild. You know, there's been hotels, hostels, sleeping in the car. It feels like I'm on tour, like a band or something, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's, everything is up to me. So if I don't organize something, then nothing gets done, you know, and yep. it's like adjusting to a different life, but it's been great. Awesome. Um, yeah. And really your new, um, business uh has grown uh, i think out of that this because you've been this is you're, you're on the three month tour but you've actually been touring around australia for a couple of years now um mm. visiting pilates studio so this is not a brand new thing um so when you were teaching 40 hours a week you would take a couple of weeks off and you know pop up to sydney or pop up to melbourne or brisbane or you know wherever and do, do a bunch of classes visit as many studios as you possibly could in that time and I know, I know you've done like two, three, four classes a day for a week sort of thing, you know, yeah. in some locations. Yeah. So, um, and then out of that trip, you started to notice patterns and started to notice, like, oh, a lot of people don't seem to get, you know, certain principles or certain, you know, things that make teaching really effective and easy. And so you mm -hmm. started, you know, offering tips and tricks for people and training people in your workplace and then it just kind of snowballed from there mm -hmm. and it's become a business right does that does that kind of accurately describe it oh so true so true and that thing you said about mystery shopping that was definitely me at the start because it was just like me just um, calling or emailing the owner and saying hey can I come and visit I'm a trainer um, I'd love to jump into some classes and and everyone would be super happy be like oh yeah for sure come along you know and completely unknown off the radar um, just some random guy from Tassie that no one ever seen before. Um, and I think actually being from Tassie in that sense kind of helped me because I wasn't really in anyone's territory. I was so far mm -hmm. away. I was so isolated that I wasn't really competing yeah. against anyone. Like helping me didn't like have a negative impact on anyone. Um, so I could kind of somehow walk into any space and everyone seemed fine. And, and um, the thing that was awesome was I'd do the class, but then after the class, I'd actually ask the trainer why they did that what in particular was the reason? Why did we do that combination? Why did we layer it? Is there a reason for it? And so it wasn't just doing it, but actually understanding why. Mm -hmm. And I found it fascinating, all the different styles and methodologies people had. And um, there's a definitely a huge gap in knowledge out there. Um, there's a, a lot of awesome instructors that actually end up not teaching as much or at all and I feel like they kind of take all their knowledge with them honestly so they they kind of mentor a lot of people in their journey and then when they go 
there's like a bit of a vacuum, especially in their immediate space where they're no longer kind of helping people come along. So what I was thinking was how cool would it be to go and visit every one of these people and learn from them, but then kind of keep a record of everything that they taught me in one spot. Um, mm. And the video content really was a form of that because the movement inspiration, you need to record it because it's just so easy to forget because there's so many moves. So um, mm. putting that out there was probably what enabled me to grow in any way. And then the, the power of social media has kind of put me on a different um, trajectory now where I just, I've got open doors before I even know where they are people message yeah. me and say, hey, do you want to come to the studio? Do you want to teach here? I'd like to do your course. It's like, wow. Um, it's on, and it's worldwide now, which is crazy. So yeah. the idea is to try and be like John Gary times 10,000 and um, <laughs> just keep growing with it, you know? Like I just got, put all the time and energy into it and keep getting better. And But the main thing is that everyone really wants to get better. Everyone wants to improve. That's the, the common theme. So... Um, having specific education on what makes a class better. I think people are kind of curious, like, what is it? What, what yeah. is that? And that's what I've been watching uh, keenly over the last couple of years. So this really started out as a personal development exercise for you. You wanted to become a better instructor, the best possible instructor you could be. So you went hmm. and wanted to go and learn from everyone else. Like, okay, what is it? You're like, everybody must have something to teach you. So, oh, you know, that is so true. So you just went and started, you know, doing people's classes and you know, um, absorbing knowledge and experience and tips and tricks. And then at some point you'd done, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 classes, whatever it was, you started to see the patterns, right? Mm. Yep. You started to you started to notice like, oh yeah, I, I kind of see, I was starting to notice what works, what doesn't work, you know, what happens if we miss out certain things or, you know, don't explain certain things clearly or whatever it might be and starting to notice the patterns in what makes a good class. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, right, so firstly, uh, in terms of, let, so let's start digging into, because uh, what I want to talk about today, so sorry, just let's back up a sec. I want to actually have a conversation with you about your business, but I want to do that in a whole separate episode, because like we were just talking off air before we started today, and actually I think it's like it's too much to include in just one episode. So I want to have a whole separate conversation about how you're starting your business and what, you know, how that works for you as a business and, and how it's growing and the challenges and the you know, things that make it work, whatever. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm super excited at the moment about the proliferation of new innovative ways that people are creating to make a good living as a place instructor that don't involve working for a wage in someone else's studio. Now, nothing wrong with working for a wage in someone else's studio, but it's like, well, everyone knows how to do that. But <laughs> and that's been an opportunity that's been around for decades. But now there's like heaps of really cool new ways that people are creating and making up new, you know, business models. And so I think mm -hmm. you've got a fairly interesting and unique business model uh, that you've basically created out of thin air for yourself. Um, so I'd really like to discuss that and un unpack it. So I think that's a whole episode. So let's put that to the side for now. Yep. Uh, and what I really want to dig into today is what you learned in those 88 studio visits mm -hmm. uh, and counting, probably mm -hmm. more than 88 now. And, and, and you know, what, what we as instructors, you know, myself and those listening can learn from, you know, so so I can learn, so I don't have to go and do 88 studio visits, you know, like what could, can you share with us the good bits, you know, <laughs> what are the main key takeaways? So, um, so but before we, before we get into that, um, you know, the backdrop here is we're in Australia and for years I thought, uh, you know, when I was learning plays, I thought, you know, all, all Pilates comes from America because Joseph Pilates lived in America when he created Contrology and all of the big brands that I was aware of at the time were in North America. So Stop Pilates in Canada, you know, Balanced Body, Bassey, Peak, you know, all of these are the North American brands. And so I thought, oh, in Australia here, we're stuck out at the arse of the earth, you know, we're 10 years behind everything. We're like the frontier town with just, a, you know, it's tumbleweed going through. Yeah, right. <laughs> and we get the fashions, you know, 10 years after they hit the big city, you know. Um, 
But when I went to the, U, the US and Canada, I would actually went to Toronto to train at Stop Pilates headquarters. I was extremely underwhelmed. I was like, holy shit, like, there's a lot of Pilates studios in Australia that are way better than this, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And, and then I went around to a bunch of studios and I'm like, oh no, they're all like this. You know, like, we're, we're, they, no, they didn't have group reformer there. This was like 2010, 9, 8, something like that. They didn't have group reform. Like, their idea of group reform was like four reformers in the studio. Now, that's not a criticism, it's a, but it was very surprising to me because, I th- like, group reform was totally normal in Australia at that, that's, at that time Spanish. as it is now. It's like, yeah. yeah. So if you say to the ran, a random person on the street, have you done Pilates, probably the picture that comes into their mind when you ask them that question is, group reformer like 12 or 14 reformers in a room with you know basically kind of a dynamic athletic sort of a style class Mm -hmm. um but in north america and you know there's now the club pilates in north america which does do something similar they do 12 reformers but it's as i understand it it's not quite the same because they do they include chair and workout and spring walls and things like that Mm -hmm. again not a criticism just an observation that it's different uh, and, you know, most of the other studios, I think, are, you know, five reformers or fewer. Um, and this has been also uh, my experience talking to people in the UK and Western Europe. I've talked to people in Germany, France, Italy, uh, Belgium, a couple of people in Brazil, um, you know, like, and heaps of people in the US. And it's like, yeah, by and large, what we think of as reformer is, as Pilates in Australia, you know, 12, 14 group you know, reformers in a room, that's not what they call it. Yeah, you know, that's not what they <laughs> what they think of as Pilates in, in those other places. So can you describe, you know, what you do, like, you know, how do you describe the style of Pilates that you teach? Yep. So it's definitely an experience. So you're kind of setting a mood in the room, engaging with people personally. There's like a lot of... Um, connection there's a lot of people that are kind of talking to each other or have the experience of kind of like relating to each other so the opposite of a gym setting which people are kind of sitting and just focusing on one point and not interacting so you want to have like a lively mood um i like you mean talking to each other during the class not during the class um because i've done your class and i wasn't in the mood for talking (laughs) i was just like head down bum up trying to keep as little sweat on the reformer as possible and yeah, you know, trying no, to take a rest every time you turn your back on me. No, no, a hundred percent. Yeah, I see them. I see those rests. Um, <laughs> but the, I'd, if people could talk during my class casually, I'd say they're not working hard enough. So I just don't let that happen either. Um, okay. Um, but there's got to be, for me, what I'm trying to achieve is a dynamic class that's going to get a calorie burn around 300, 250, 300 for a beginner class. Um, and then it scales up as you go higher. Um, full body, um, I want it to be appropriate to the ability level in the room. So depending on the class, I'm going to teach things with less complexity. If it's like more new people, for sure, because I want them to get the most of their time. And it's going to be something that's going to try and push their comfort zone. So I'm going to hold people in positions for long enough to guarantee they're going to get a result out of that exercise, every exercise. I think that's the key it's just delivering every time and i always kind of use the analogy like when you buy something online it's like there's an expected kind of delivery date and then it comes and it builds trust so if every single exercise you teach you tell the clients this is what we're doing this is where you're going to feel it and then at the end of the exercise that's exactly what they get and it's just trust multiplied again and again and again and eventually there's so much trust that there's zero um, resistance to anything you do or say in the room so that the class flows so quick because people are actively listening to you or they might even do things they've never heard of before but they trust that you know exactly what you're doing so they might the toes might go straight onto the bar or they might take that progression they're not guessing they're like mm. it's like you have some kind of crazy insight into what they're experiencing right now so they just want to they know that you know and that changes <laughs> And it changes how they feel. It's like, I feel like if you got on a plane and then you looked at the pilot and you saw the pilot was like really nervous, you'd be like, oh shit, are we going to be okay? You know? But if you see the pilot just relaxed, you know, um, it makes you feel good. So if you're instructing a class and you know exactly what everyone's feeling and you can tell them what they're going to feel before they feel it, 
and you tell them why we're doing it, you give them all the reasons why, like you bring meaning to their suffering, it gives them a lot of like encouragement to that they're doing the right thing. Like, um, and meaning to the suffering is huge. Like, mm. because if I said to you, Raf, hey, um, can you, you know, hold a plank right now for five minutes? You'd probably be like, oh, you know, I don't really want to, you know, yeah. it's a lot of effort. If I, I said, hey, <laughs> well, I said, Raf, you know, if I knew what motivated you, but let's just throw a number. I say, hey, Raf, I'll give you like $10 million cash right now if you can hold this plank for five minutes. You would. Yeah, I'd you be would. more motivated, yeah. Yeah. And for I, can the, I can guarantee I'd hold it. Yeah. But the thing is that the suffering didn't change, you no. know, but the reason to do it did. But that just made yeah. it different somehow. So, like, yeah. enabling the clients to understand why we're doing this movement will help them do it better and do it longer. So, I've, I feel like I'd set the class up so we do less exercises. And if you do less exercises, then you've got more time to explain why we're doing them. And then mm. in that process, they actually improve quicker because they understand what they're doing and they learn faster. So the clients actually progress quicker when you do less, which is the opposite of what you would think, but it's really, really true because they actually get to master what they're doing as opposed to just rushing through it. Um, yeah. And they don't spend time wasted in transitions. That's the number... If I was going to put it on a list of number one things that will disturb a class, and when I say class, I mean the outcome of the class, what the result is. If you have a lot of exercises, then you have a lot of cost in transition time. Changing your body, changing the springs, changing the props, you know, that takes away time with the workout. So yeah. the more changes, the less workout. And the context here is that most of these workouts are like 45, 50 minutes, 60 minutes tops, right? Mm. Yep. Yeah. And so when you say results, what do you mean by results? Like the result of the class, the result of the exercise? What do you mean by that? Uh, mechanical tension, actually improving the strength or the conditioning of the client. So you'd see like a, a physical adaption, like they would actually be better at the movement mm -hmm. slash do anything similar to that movement better. Like they'd be right, able to so walk they can it. do more reps or they can hold it for longer or they can add a spring or take off a spring or, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's the way I like to look at the beginner class experience, because if you look at the, what a personal trainer does, a personal trainer, really only adjust the load or the volume to get a result. Right. So and you start out doing, you know, leg press on day one of your personal training, you know, 12 months later, you're still doing leg press, but you just got more weight on there. Mm. Um, and what helps the beginners the most is actually doing something a lot so they become very familiar. So yeah. all you really do with the beginners is just adjust the load or the reps, even in the class. And that will help them improve their attributes. And the thing is, when their attributes are better, they'll better do anything else better too. So they're actually kind of ready now to take on things that are more complex because the more complex things, they they tend to have less stability. Um, and if you have less stability, you need to have better conditioning because like, you're going to fatigue quicker if you're less stable. So um, it's also higher risk if you're less stable. Like, like if... One thing I like to talk about in my program is with the clients um, to do with how every exercise isn't exactly the same, even though it's the same movement pattern or the muscle groups. Like if you look at a lunge facing the front on the ground with your inside foot in the shoulder pad, you're the most stable you could ever be because the surface of the ground is quite hard. The foot bar's in front of you, so there's no really place you could fall. If you did, you could catch yourself. If you do the same movement, let's say this is a light spring for all of these. So bend the front knee, tip the torso forward. So the challenge is gravity. So you're kind of moving the, the force or the load, the load of your body weight onto the glutes on the standing leg as you lean forward. If you do that on a box, the box is slightly softer. So it's a little bit harder to stabilize. You're higher off the ground. So if you were to fall, the outcome would be worse. And it doesn't really feel like a big deal to you and me because our attributes are fine but if someone doesn't have great balance it does yeah. feel like a big deal and that makes them hesitant so when they move in a hesitant way they don't move well and they fatigue pretty quick um, and then if you keep scaling up the complexity like if we went and did the same lunge now where you're standing on the platform 
and you have your back foot on the carriage and you do the same movement, bend the front knee, lean forward. Now, the foot bar is going to have to be lower for you to stand there. So there's less things that could support you. So if you fall from there, the outcome is going to be worse. And a lot of the platforms out there, they're either small and awkward or they're large and soft. So both of those options aren't awesome. But then if you did it facing the back, it's even harder again. So imagine if you're standing on the platform facing the pulleys and then you step... You would call that like a Russian split or a back split. Oh, yeah. It's like a, a forward lunge, but you're facing the back. So you, yeah. you step the foot onto the carriage and the, you lean your body weight over the carriage as the carriage moves out. And then you push the stand up and the carriage comes back. So now you have to stabilize your body on a moving surface. Nothing's going to stop you if you fall. I mean, you could have the box short ways, which would give you some emotional support and physical support. But like the outcome, it's just harder to do that. But it's the same yeah. muscle group, the same movement pattern, but it's not the same ease of to do it. Like to right. do the lunge on the floor is way easier and safer than doing it on the machine. So actually giving the clients the best version of an exercise to their ability level helps them improve quicker because they can do more reps and do them better when it's easier. And um, there's, there's, there's some interesting, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm with you on that. And the, the science behind that is, uh, I find it interesting anyway, is that as you, um, you know, in any movement, so say in the lunge on the floor, when you're, you, you're coming up, you're standing up out of lunge, okay, you're working your glutes of the standing leg, the quads of the standing leg, um, and they're the prime movers in the in the exercise. But then you're also working your adductors and your abductors in the standing leg, and they're they're called the synergists, the muscles that you know help hold your torso upright, and stop you tipping over to the to the side one way or the other, stop you hip hiking out or whatever. Yep. Uh, and then you have the opposing muscles, so you have the hip flexors uh, and maybe the hamstrings. Although the hamstrings are a little bit different in the squat because they or a lunge because they basically work isometrically. But let's just say the hip flexors which are the opposite of the glutes, right? They're hip flexors, glutes, hip extensors. In a lunge, as you're standing up out of lunge, well, the, the hip flexors are lengthening, right? So they're not contracting to power the movement, but they are on because you have to decelerate at the top of the movement, right? You don't want to actually jump off the ground. So, and you want you don't want your torso to keep flipping over backwards and do a, a backflip. So you have to use your hip flexors to decelerate the movement. So all through that movement, you know, all of the muscles in your legs are working, but obviously your glutes and quads are working much more because they're providing the main power for the movement and you, but your abducts and your abducts and your hip flexors are all working to kind of help stabilise, directionalise, decelerate, etc. Uh -huh. And the thing is, in a, in a very stable position, like when your foot's on the floor in a lunge, it's like, you know, I'm just making up the percentage here, but, you know, it, I think it's for illustrative purposes. You know, let's say it's like 90% glutes and quads and 10% everything else put together right? But then when you get onto a, a, a really unstable situation, so when you say you take that same movement, you put the, that, that front foot, put it on the carriage, okay, and now you're pushing the carriage out on a light spring and, and doing the same exact movement pattern, but the carriage is, you know, moving front to back, so you've got a lot more instability in the forward to back direction, but it's also a sort of a soft surface, so that it's unstable in the left to right, mm. you know, in the side to side direction as well. Yeah. Uh, and because of that, you have to co-contract all of those adductors and abductors and hip flexors and things a lot more to stabilise, right? So you're working a lot harder in those um, assisting muscles. And because you're working a lot harder in those assisting muscles, essentially they provide like deceleration, right? They're, they're, they're resisting the, move, the, the action of the glutes and the, and the quads, mm -hmm. right? So essentially, when you increase the instability of a movement, you reduce the amount of power that comes from the main muscle. So when you're doing that, say, that same lunge with the foot on the, like the second one we said, where the foot's on the carriage, okay, the front foot's on the carriage, um, instead of like 90% glutes and quads and 10% everything else, it might be like 60% glutes and quads, 40% everything else, yep. right? So you're a lot more adductors, a lot more abductors, a lot more hip flexors less glutes and quads because if you use full power in that situation you can't control it yeah right so yep. your brains and your motor cortex inhibits those prime mover muscles and prevents them from you know maximally re being maximally recruited because you, it's not stable enough for you to to apply that power it's like you've got this massive big engine in a car but no brakes or steering right yep. so you, when you're on an icy road you have to drive slow right yep. and so doing a lunge on the, with your foot on the carriage is the kind of 
body equivalent of driving on an icy road. It's like you can't use all your power. Mm. And so because you can't use all your power, you can't develop more power because that's in the body. That's how we develop more power and strength is by using power and strength. So actually it's well known, well established in exercise science that if you want to increase maximum strength and power, you've got to do it in a very stable environment because you can get much greater recruitment. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't ever work in an unstable situation because it's great to practice you know, stabilising and all that. that's useful, right? It's probably a useful skill, particularly for people who need to improve balance and whatever. But just if your goal is to improve strength of, say, your glutes and quads, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, do it in a very stable environment because then you can maximise the load because you're not, there's no kind of tax, you know, stability tax, shall we say. Yeah. Yeah, well, it sounds like a really awesome articulated version of the simple version that I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, all right. So basically, you know, your, your North Star in this, you know, your ideal of, you know, a good class mm-hmm. is one where you get enough tension, enough mechanical tension on those muscle groups, you know, and basically you said a whole body class, so I'm going to say like on all the muscles, <laughs> right yep. at some point during the class mm-hmm. where there is a stimulus for those muscles to become stronger yep right so basically after i do you know 10 classes i'll feel a difference 20 classes i'll see the difference 30 classes i'll have a whole new body <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, so that, was, that uh, was just a butcher joseph Pilates no yeah it's um yeah. it's funny it's funny I don't even know if I want to say it, but there's a lady in Mexico last week that said I was the Joseph of 2022. And I was just like, that's the funniest thing I've heard. <laughs> I don't know how maybe I feel about that. that. Um, maybe that Instagram handle is still available, Joseph 2022. <laughs> um, I don't know, we'll leave that. All right, so, all right, so, so in, in, your, in your lights, um, you know, getting stronger, you know, and I use that term kind of generically because I'm including under that umbrella improving endurance or, you know, whatever. Yeah. But basically improving your physical capacity, increasing your physical capacity is, that's what you mean by results, right? Yeah, 100%. Like, I think that's a great outcome from investment of time and energy, you know? Right. Yeah. All right. And so, so, you know, so you go around Australia, you know, visit all these studios, you know, you said the, you know, you started to notice the patterns. Well, what were the patterns? You know, what were the thing, what were the top sort of five or whatever number of things that you noticed that were the common elements of a really effective class? And what were the what were the flip side of those? What were the things that were common elements of a not really awesome class? Yep. Let's start, let's start with the awesome ones first. Awesome is starts the second you walk in the door. 